Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Recently, I dusted off our old AMD FX test system to see how the FX8370 was getting on in 2020 for gaming. I compared it to the Ryzen 7 1700, Ryzen 3 3300X, and Ryzen 5 3600 using a range of GeForce GPUs. The GPU scaling results were quite interesting as they gave us a look at how the old FX processor compared to the newer Ryzen parts with not just a high-end graphics card like the RTX 2080 Ti and 2070 Super, but also low-end models such as the GTX 1650 Super. Now, following on from that testing, today we're going to be adding the unlocked Sandy Bridge Core i5 2500K and Core i7 2600K processors to the data. And once again, for comparison, I'll be including the third gen Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 processors. Having seen how poorly the FX8370 handled demanding titles such as Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I'm not expecting the Core i5 2500K to do any better but it will be interesting to see how the 2600K gets on with its hyper-threading support. And in particular, I'm interested to see how it compares to the much newer Ryzen 3 3300X. If my memory serves me correctly, the first gen Ryzen parts weren't a great deal faster than the Sandy Bridge processors, but of course, AMD's Ryzen range has come a long way in the past three years. So not only are we getting to take a look at how these FX and Sandy Bridge processors compare with one another, but also how they compare with today's best value CPUs priced under $200 US. Now, for testing the AMD FX8370, as well as both the Intel Core i5 2500K and Core i7 2600K processors, they've been paired with 16 gigabytes of DDR3 2400CL11 memory, while the newer Ryzen processors use DDR4 3200CL14 memory. Other than that, the GPUs used this time around include the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, RTX 2070 Super, RTX 2060, and GTX 1650 Super. Oh, and as was the case last time, all the data shown in this video is based on stock performance. Yes, you can overclock the FX processor, and yeah, it does perform a little bit better, but you can also overclock the Intel processors, and guess what? They'll perform a bit better as well. So it just becomes an overclocking arms race, and neither side ends up winning. On a side note, I swear the same people that claim FX processors are overclocking beasts and bang on about Northbridge overclocking are the exact same people that ended up buying Vega GPUs, rocking back and forth in their chair, mumbling words like undervolt it. Anyway, now that I've got that off my chest, let's check out the graphs. Starting with the Far Cry New Dawn results, we see that when paired with an RTX 2080 Ti, the Core i5-2500K is 35% faster than the FX8370, while it was also slightly faster than the 2600K. We've seen this in the past for titles that don't utilize more than four cores. Disabling hyper-threading on the i7 processors can improve performance, so these results aren't terribly shocking. Similar margins were also seen with the RTX 2070 Super and even the RTX 2060. In fact, even with the lowly GTX 1650 Super, the 2500K was still 24% faster than the FX8370 and a whopping 42% faster when comparing the 1% low performance. That's a devastating margin. And with the vast majority of games released over the past few years likely to show similar margins, it does paint quite the brutal picture for the aging FX processor. Now, when compared to third gen Ryzen, Sandy Bridge owners stand to gain some pretty significant performance. The 3300X, for example, was a little over 40% faster than the 2600K, and again, that margin was seen with not just the RTX 2080 Ti, but also the 2070 Super and RTX 2060. In fact, it's not until you drop down to the GTX 1650 Super that the margins between the Ryzen and Sandy Bridge processors become insignificant. Reducing the quality preset to normal, so a medium type setting, which is something those with a GTX 1650 Super might do, this actually widens the margins further between the 2500K and FX8370. Whereas previously the base GPU saw the 2500K lead by a 24% margin, here it's now 31% faster. We also see whereas the FX processor barely averaged 60 FPS, the 2500K and 2600K maintained well over 60 FPS at all times in our test, and as a result the performance difference was very noticeable. Next up, we have Rainbow Six Siege using the Vulkan API, and this game isn't very CPU demanding, as evidenced by the fact that the FX8370 does quite well here. The 2500K and 2600K are still faster, but the performance difference is negligible. Basically, all three CPUs are able to deliver highly playable performance. It's also interesting to note that last time we compared Ryzen to Sandy Bridge, we did so using first and second gen Ryzen CPUs using a GTX 1080 Ti. 
which is similar to the RTX 2070 Super in terms of performance. Here we see using the faster third gen Ryzen processors along with a much more powerful RTX 2080 Ti, this shows just how far behind the older CPUs are when not GPU limited. Here the 3300X was almost 40% faster than the 2600K. Lowering the quality preset to medium slightly increases the margin between the Sandy Bridge and FX8370 processors, and we also see when going the other way, it also extends the third gen Ryzen processors lead over the Intel chips. The shadow of the Tomb Raider results were probably the most shocking in the previous GPU scaling video when looking at the FX8370. Here we see that the 2500K is indeed no better, delivering the same stuttery performance. So that's a fail in our opinion for both CPUs. The 2600K though, that was noticeably better. And although the experience was far from flawless, the game is now playable at a reasonable standard. It's shocking to see the 3300X delivering over 50% more frames than the 2600K with just the RTX 2060. That margin grew to over 80% with the RTX 2070 Super and RTX 2080 Ti, so pretty incredible stuff. The key issue here for the older Sandy Bridge processors is memory bandwidth. The DDR3 2133 memory limits them to less than half the read-write bandwidth of the more modern Ryzen processors. And lowering the quality preset to medium does little to help out Sandy Bridge, just as we saw previously with the FX8370. It does, however, help to reduce the GPU bottleneck with the RTX 2060 and GTX 1650 Super, and that extends the performance advantage for the third gen Ryzen processors with these GPUs. Gears Tactics is another game where the FX8370 really struggled, though the performance was playable. That said, the Sandy Bridge CPUs are significantly faster, particularly the 2500K, which again benefits from a lack of hyperthreading. Even so, the 2600K was still at least 20% faster than the FX8370 when using the RTX 2080 Ti, RTX 2070 Super, and even the RTX 2060. In fact, it wasn't until we dropped down to the GTX 1650 Super that a significant enough GPU bottleneck had been created, allowing the FX8370 to catch up. But getting back to the higher end GPU results, looking at the RTX 2070 Super, we see that the 2500K was up to 36% faster than the FX8370, and yet despite that, the 3300X was still 46% faster than the 2600K. It's quite impressive to see just how far processor technology has come. And before moving on, here's a look at Gears Tactics using the medium quality preset, and the CPU limiter results are quite shocking. The 3300X still maintains a similar lead over the 2600K, here we're looking at a 48% margin, but what's really shocking is the 96% margin we now see when comparing the 2500K and FX8370. That is a brutal margin between two CPUs that were essentially direct competitors back when they were released. As I imagine Yoda would say, future-proof the FX8370 was not. World War Z, much like Rainbow Six Siege, isn't particularly CPU demanding, and as a result the FX8370 is able to deliver playable performance. Moreover, the 2500K isn't a great deal faster, at least when comparing the 1% low performance, though it was up to 19% faster when comparing the average frame rate. The more noteworthy margins can be seen when looking at the 2600K and 3300X, for example. Here, the third gen Ryzen processor was a staggering 65% faster with the RTX 2080 Ti. Lowering the quality preset to medium doesn't really change much here. We're seeing virtually the same margins as the ultra settings, so let's move on. Last up we have Borderlands 3, and this is another game that's not super CPU demanding, and as a result the FX8370 does just fine, though as I noted in the last video looking at the old AMD CPU, load times were painfully slow. The Sandy Bridge CPUs were noticeably faster when it came to loading the game, but they were still quite a bit slower than the third gen Ryzen processors, despite delivering comparable performance with the RTX 2060 and GTX 1650 Super. Now, dropping the quality preset to medium did increase the margins, at least to the Ryzen CPUs. The FX and Sandy Bridge parts were quite evenly matched, though Intel did still maintain a performance advantage. Looking at the 2600K, it was again quite incredible to see over a 50% margin in favour of the 3300X with the RTX 2080 Ti. If it wasn't clear enough back in 2011, 2012 and 2013, surely it has to be crystal clear in 2020. Unfortunately, AMD's FX series just wasn't good. Not back then, and it certainly isn't now. And it's a real shame, and it's also why the company almost fell off the rails entirely. 
For gaming at least, the FX series was a complete and utter disaster. It's really not enough that in titles like Borderlands 3, World War Z and Rainbow Six Siege that use low level APIs and just aren't at all CPU intensive to begin with, that parts like the FX8370 do well, or at least well enough. If all the gaming results looked like what we saw in those titles and the FX series was strong in productivity benchmarks, we would have basically had a Ryzen type situation on our hands with AMD's bulldozer architecture. Unfortunately though, the margins seen in most games over the years look more like what we saw in Far Cry New Dawn, Gears Tactics, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider for example. It's the inconsistent performance that was the real issue for the FX series, well that and the horribly high power consumption. The good news for not just AMD, but also those who purchased an AMD FX processor, and are unlucky enough to still be using it in 2020, relatively inexpensive third gen Ryzen processors offer massive performance gains across the board, not to mention all the new platform features. Granted, the Ryzen 3 3300X has been out of stock forever now, but the availability of the Ryzen 5 3600 has been strong, and it's currently selling for $175 US. All that said, it is well worth noting that the release of Zen 3 really shouldn't be that far away. So if you can, I suggest you hold off on that upgrade. But the point is, CPU performance has come a long way, and today budget type offerings are much faster than anything you could have purchased for under $500 US back in 2011, 2012, and even 2013. And that means the upgrade for Sandy Bridge owners is also quite significant, especially if you plan on upgrading your graphics card. And I suspect the upcoming next gen GPUs coupled with AMD Zen 3 processors are gonna prompt a good many of you to finally upgrade. So that's exciting. And that is going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like. Hope you guys find these GPU scaling benchmarks as interesting as I do. I found this one particularly interesting looking at the old FX series versus the Sandy Bridge processors, and then of course, third gen Ryzen thrown in there as well. But yeah, it's gonna do it for this one. If you appreciate the work we do at Hiram Boxed and you wanna support us and also join us over on Patreon, you can do so, link is in the video description. Some pretty cool perks there. Monthly live stream, which will be coming up on the channel next week. So they're always good. Uh, what else have we got? Q and A's, behind the scenes videos, the exclusive Discord chat. So that's a great community, the Harbour Unbox community over on Discord. Good place to be if you like all this sort of stuff. And yeah, but above all else, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.